My name is Philip Brown, and I'm from Washington, UBF. The nation's capital. <laughs> Welcome all of you to America. Um, the title of my message today is The Glory of the Crucified Christ. The key verse is John 19.30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being a glorious God. Thank you for blessing our conference so far and helping us see a glimpse of your glory. At this time, please send your Holy Spirit among us and be our helper. Help us see the glory of your crucified Son, whom you sent. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever finished something? Do you know the joy and satisfaction in completing something? Something that you finished, and it never has to be done again. How great! In John's account of Jesus' crucifixion, John writes that Jesus' last words on the cross were, It is finished. It was the shout of victory by the Son of God who finished the work his Father gave him and completed our salvation. How satisfying it was to Jesus. It is finished. And how powerful it is for us who believe in these three words. It is finished. Today's account of the crucifixion was written by the Apostle John, who was an eyewitness to the scene. He writes, so that you may believe in Jesus finished work and have life in his name. Through today's message, may you see the glory of the crucified Christ and have life in his name. Part one, the crucifixion of Christ, verses 16 to 27. In yesterday's message by Eberhard, we saw that in Jesus, the glory of God became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The eternal creator, almighty God, came to this world and became flesh. How glorious. Though he did lots of glorious things, raising the dead, healing lepers, etc., the hour of his glorification can be found in today's passage. It is the reason for his coming, becoming flesh. It was the most glorious event in human history. This glorious God would humble himself to do the most amazing, most loving, most powerful thing for mankind. He would be crucified for our sin. Let's see John's account of Jesus' crucifixion. Look at verse 16a. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Though Pilate found no basis for a charge against Jesus and tried to free him, the hostile Jewish crowd kept pressuring him, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate was dumbfounded at their request. He asked the most remarkable question, shall I crucify your king? To crucify a king was unheard of. Thieves, robbers, insurrectionists were crucified, but kings were honored and served and bowed down to and worshipped. But this is what happened to Jesus. He was crucified. 
Look at verses 16 and 17. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. King Jesus was led like a hardened criminal by his soldiers. Prior to this, Jesus had suffered so much. He was surely worn down from long trials, a flogging, crowns of thorns twisted and put on his head, and blows to his face. There was not an ounce of his body that was not in severe pain. Yet John writes that Jesus carried his own cross. A wooden cross was said to weigh anywhere from 100 to 300 pounds. How heavy was the cross? Jesus taught that if anyone would follow after him, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow him. Jesus was taking up his cross that his father gave him as exceedingly heavy as it was. And he was carrying it to Golgotha. Look at verse 18. There they crucified him. And with him, two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. John writes his account of the crucifixion as a matter of fact, like a man reporting a crime scene. He writes it as a matter of fact, so that you may believe it as a matter of fact. There they crucified him. There was a place in Hebrew, Golgotha, there was someone doing the crucifying, the Roman soldiers, and there was Jesus being crucified. His position was in the middle. In all of his life, John probably never forgot that scene. There they crucified him. The one through whom all things were made, the miracle worker, the one who had loved him and borne all of his weaknesses, he was being crucified. When John wrote this account of the crucifixion, everyone was very familiar with it, so he doesn't explain it in great detail. But when Jesus was crucified, he experienced long iron spikes driven through his hands and his feet the most tender parts of the body. Well, on the cross, his body was stretched to the point where all of his muscles were likely torn, all of his bones out of joint. To even breathe was especially painful and cumbersome. To take a breath, Jesus would have had to stand up and place all of his nail weight on his nailed feet, which would have caused excruciating pain. When it was too much to bear, he would then place all of his weight back on his hands and his wrists, but be unable to breathe. He would go back and forth in this way for hours. Hundreds of years earlier, the psalmist told of Jesus' pain on the cross. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. Isaiah foresaw his appearance on the cross so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. The four gospel writers pointed out different things in their accounts of Jesus' crucifixion. Yet all of them share the one detail shown in verse 19. Look at verse 19. It says, Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. 
It was customary for a man being crucified to have a notice fastened to the cross stating the reason for his execution. While others were being crucified for their deeds, God gave Pilate insight that Jesus was being crucified for who he was. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. This was written in three languages, Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Together, they represented the entire world at the time. All of mankind. Jesus was crucified for all of mankind. When we look on this story from a human perspective, it seems another sad story of injustice. But we see from John's account that this was anything but that. It was not Pilate who sent him, nor the Jewish mob, nor is it just the evil of man. But it was God who sent his son Jesus to the cross and was fulfilling scripture. Three times in this passage, John mentions so that scripture would be fulfilled. It was God who was fulfilling his glorious will in even the smallest detail. Look at verses 23 to 24. When Jesus was crucified, he was stripped naked by soldiers. The soldiers took his clothes and divided them into four shares, one for each of them. Only the seamless undergarment remained. They did not tear it, but decided by lot who would get it. It was a dreadful moment for Jesus. Not only was he crucified, but in his humiliation, all of his clothes were taken. And he was left to watch four evil soldiers play games over his clothes even his undergarment. How vulnerable was Jesus made at that very hour? With his hands and feet nailed to the cross, there was nothing he could do to cover himself or keep the soldiers from doing what they did. He was like a lamb led to a slaughter. Even in this horrifying scene, John saw scripture being fulfilled. Look at verse 24. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. John saw that the soldiers were doing exactly as what God had prophesied nearly 1,000 years earlier. So this is what the soldiers did. The horror was not just a random act of evil, but what God had planned for a son to undertake. Having lost all of his dignity, all soundness in his body, all of his clothes, he then experiences the sadness of leaving those closest to him. Near the cross were four women, including his mother and John, who identified himself as the apostles whom Jesus loved. They were people who were very precious to Jesus, most loyal to Jesus. They even followed him to the crucifixion site. One can only imagine the pain inside as they watched Jesus suffer on the cross. Jesus sees them and comforts them. He sees their suffering. To his mother, he says, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. Jesus saw their needs and took care of them. Jesus, deep love, even on the cross, shows us his glory. When we look at the crucifixion, we see a very repulsive scene. It was so cruel. It has long been banned as a means of punishment in this world. 
If God was in control, why did he send his son to purposefully suffer and die like this? If we look at why Jesus came and for what purpose, we see that it all has to do with sin. The Bible says Jesus came to save his people from their sin. Jesus Christ suffered for sin. He died for our sins. He was an atoning sacrifice for sins. He is the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. God sending Jesus to the cross had everything to do with sin. It is the most serious issue between God and man. The Romans used crucifixion to punish slaves, insurrectionists, thieves, etc. The punishment was harsh, more than they could bear. But when God sent Jesus to the cross, he was punishing sin. He was pouring out his wrath against our sins on him. He was bearing our sins. How terrible are man's sins before a holy God. When Jesus was on the cross, he was not only suffering physical pain, but a much greater suffering was his spiritual pain. In bearing our sins, Jesus was forsaken by even his own father. In his agony, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In order to save us from sin, Jesus momentarily gave up the greatest thing he ever knew, which he had from the beginning, fellowship with his father. At that point, when Jesus became sin for us, the Father turned away from even his own Son. How awful is our sin, and how holy is our God. Often, we are blinded in this world to see our sin problem. And when we compare ourselves to others, we can justify ourselves. But the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The standard of goodness is the glory of God. When you see the glory of God, one realizes just how sinful they really are. When Isaiah saw God sitting high on the throne, he said, he was ruined for he was a man of unclean lips. When the disciples realized Jesus was God and was in the same boat with them, they were terrified. How terrible it is to be a sinner in the hands of a holy God who hates evil and sin. If we have to bear our own sins before God, how can we stand? Thankfully, at the cross, God sent Jesus in our place to bear the heavy weight of our sins. We must ask ourselves, why would he do that? Why would he send his own, his own son to do that? As holy as God is, he is also so loving. He is perfectly holy and perfectly loving. When he gave his son, it was an act that revealed his great, amazing love for man. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Yeah. 
There's no greater love in this world. No greater love you can ever imagine. No greater love you could ever expect or hope to find than the Father's love through Jesus Christ, His Son. How glorious is our God. In His love for us, He did not even spare His one and only Son. How great and deep the Father's love for us really is. Part two, it is finished. From John's account, there's one thing Jesus really wanted us to communicate as well. Let's read verse 30. Uh, let's read, can we read together? When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. John writes that the words, it is finished, was said right after receiving the drink and just before bowing his head and giving up his spirit. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. John records these words as the last words spoken by Jesus. Have you ever desired to say something really badly that after you say them, you can be at peace and even die? This is how Jesus felt. He so desired to say these words that afterwards he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Why did he say it? It is finished. What does it mean? When Jesus said, it is finished, it meant the work, the Father, sin and far was accomplished. It was complete. John's gospel emphasizes that Jesus was sent by his Father to do his work. In all of his life, Jesus was on a mission from God the Father who sent him. He even said, my food is to do the work of the Father who sent me and finish his work. He loved his father and lived to finish the father's work. Do his will. Despite his loneliness, despite the opposition, despite rejection, despite the failures of his disciples, he kept going with this finished work in mind. Nothing would stop him. He marched resolutely into Jerusalem to give his very life. Having perfectly obeyed his father and sent, who sent him and given his life, how exceedingly happy he must have been to return to his father. It is finished. When Jesus said, it is finished, it was a shout of victory by the Son of God. Unlike the first Adam, he defeated Satan. He conquered sin. Three days later, he would rise again and defeat the power of death. God's promise to Abraham that all peoples will be blessed through him was complete. God's promise to Hosea that a people, not his people, could be called his people was complete. God's promise to Isaiah that the Lord would lay on him the iniquity of us all was complete. God's promise to David to establish an eternal kingdom through his descendant was complete. The Lion of Judah triumphed. He won. When Jesus shouted, it is finished, it was not just his own achievement. But he longed for you and I to know this as well. He didn't say it to himself. He didn't mutter it. But he said it out loud 
for man to hear. Do you hear it? It is finished. When we accept and believe in Jesus' finished work, we become the most blessed people. In Greek, it is finished also means paid in full. It was often written on business documents or receipts to show that a debt was no longer owed. When Jesus was dying on the cross, the ransom for our sins was paid in full. Jesus was taking on all of God's wrath and condemnation for our sins. He finished taking it on. He took every last drop of God's wrath for every last one of our sins. Hallelujah. God's glorious plan of salvation for sinners was complete. There's nothing we have to add to it. No pain we could inflict upon ourselves. But he paid the full price for our sins once and for all. Because Jesus took on the full wrath of our sins, he is able to do something beyond glorious for us. Colossians 1.22 says, But now he has reconciled you through Christ's physical body to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. How unholy we are. How many blemishes do we have? How much wrong we can be accused of every hour. But praise be to God and Jesus Christ that when Jesus was on the cross and he gave up his life, he was the Lamb of God who took away our sins. He is able to present us holy in God's sight without blemish and free from accusation. Perfect. How glorious. Because of what he has done for us, we have the most secure, most glorious future. We can know for certain where we are going. The disciples were troubled at the thought of Jesus leaving them. But because he was going to the cross, they didn't need to be troubled. He was going to the cross to prepare a place in his father's house for them. How glorious. Praise God for Jesus who has secured our eternal salvation forever. Because Jesus completed the work his father gave him, our salvation is certain. It is not 80% and 20% left the chance or hope. But it's 100% certain. Because he 100% finished the work his father gave him and completed all the Father required of, of him, we can be 100% confident. Are you confident in Jesus' finished work?
Praise God. When we were confident in Jesus, finished work, all doubt, all fear, all worry about tomorrow, all guilt and condemnation can be banished forever. We are free to serve the living God peacefully and joyfully until he comes again. Who secured our salvation? Was it your accomplishment? No. Jesus finished it. Jesus did it. He paid it all. He fulfilled all of God's requirements. He laid down his life. He shed his blood. And he will present you perfect, blameless, and holy before the Father. When did he do it? While we were still sinners, he died for us. While we were God's enemies, while we were engrossed in a life of sin and rebellion against him, he shed his blood for us. There's nothing we did to deserve it. But by his grace, when we believe his finished work, we are saved. This is the best news. He has done it. It is finished. These days, many modern people are deceived into thinking the gospel is outdated, a thing of the past. However, when Jesus said it was finished, it meant his work would stand forever. It was good yesterday, it's good today, and it will be good tomorrow. Through the cross, we find the answer to our biggest problems of today. Through believing in Jesus' finished work, we find joy to overcome depression. Through believing in Jesus' finished work, we find our identity as children of God, the ones Jesus loved. We find hope for tomorrow. Do you want to solve your life problem? Go to the cross and his finished work. Do you want to help the next generation? Go to the cross and his finished work. Last night, we heard the message on how Jesus saved and healed the paralytic. In my life, I was like that paralyzed man. Though I really wanted to do good and knew the good I should do, I was powerless to do any good thing. I was full of fatalism about my life. One clear manifestation of this was in my speech. I had a terrible stutter for many years. Because of this, I, I suffered greatly, not being able to speak clearly to anyone for many years. I wondered, how, how could I have any friends? How could I get married? How could I find a job? Then one day as I studied Mark chapter 5, the grace of Jesus touched my heart. I was shocked by Jesus who paid the price to save a demon-possessed man in whom there was nothing good. I couldn't understand it. It blew my mind. The man was not worth it. I said to myself, he was good for nothing. But from this, God opened my eyes. I was the miserable sinner Jesus was willing to save at any cost. I was a useless man to God. I had nothing to give him, to show him 
for my life. Yet Jesus was willing to go to the cross and pay the price of my sins. He suffered and died for my sins. His wounds were for my sins. He carried his cross for my sins. Suddenly, this Jesus suddenly became very glorious to me. I no longer thought of myself as one who was suffering, but one who was blessed to know Jesus. When I found his goodness, my own burden of trying to be good enough was lifted. I received 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31 as my life key verses. Though I wanted to leave the church because I was not good enough, God chose me, a weak and foolish thing, a thing that was not to reveal his glory and goodness. Before knowing Christ, the last thing I wanted to do was open my mouth to speak before people. It was a torture. <laughs> but afterwards, God gave me a yes, Lord, heart. I accepted to use my mouth to speak about his goodness and his glory. By God's grace, I married a great, precious, beautiful woman of faith, Sarah. She is, she is my suitable helper. And I'm also a happy father of two wonderful sons. More than that, God gave me a great mission as shepherd of God's flock in Washington, D.C. Thank God for his grace. Do you believe it is finished? Are you living like it is finished? I thank God for giving me this message I'm currently serving as, as the director of Washington UBF. Um, before preparing this message, I, I was struggling with two issues. I'm not good enough to do this. And, and nothing I could do was ever enough. And I, I felt burdened. But God spoke to me through the passage, it is finished. I didn't call you because of your talent or your ability or your goodness. I called you to preach Christ crucified. I've already done it. He's already done it. What a load off my shoulder. <laughs> Through this, God renewed my joy and spirit. And it, I found the answer to my problem again. Believe his finished work and share his finished work. I pray wherever you are in your life or mission life, you too may hold on to his finished work. He is enough. After saying it is finished, Jesus bowed his head and gave up his spirit. His mission accomplished the time had come for Christ to surrender his life. Nobody took it from him. Jesus gave up his life of his own will. He poured out his life for sinners, and he was returning to the Father who sent him. How glorious was our Lord Jesus. It is finished. John wrote his account of the crucifixion so you may believe this. May God help you to believe this all-powerful, 
and all loving act and have life in his name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, thank you that you are a glorious God. Your glory is beyond our comprehension. Lord, thank you for sending your son Jesus to be crucified for our sins. Lord, may you help us to uh, believe in Jesus, finish work, and have life in his name. Help us hold on to it and proclaim it. Thank you, Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.